Okay, so I'm going to explain two concepts to you today, uh, learning in public and learning gears. Um, I would say that in my career, it has, these have been two breakthrough concepts that have really accelerated my career. And it's not just about growing a network or um, getting jobs or uh, improving your skills. Um, it's also about sort of intellectually um, and emotionally rewarding experiences of sharing what you know. So let's just go, let's just go right into it. So uh, does everyone know about The Secret? This is a very, very famous book that came out maybe 10 years ago. Um, this is a very famous book that uh, tells you the secret to success. And if you read through it, uh, it the secret is basically uh, they're talking about the law of attraction, which claims that thoughts can change a person's life. So if you want success, you just got to think really, really hard and you will be successful. Um, and th this, is a, this is a pretty common school of thought. They're not necessarily um, unique in that respect, but it is very popular because then the only problem with you, the only problem with why you're not successful is you just didn't believe in yourself hard enough. Uh, obviously, the flaw in this comes when you have two teams um, playing in, in a competitive match. And so they cannot both believe hard enough <laughs> that they will win. Um, if anything, learning public is the opposite of the secret. It is not about belief, it is about actions, and specifically the action of sharing learnings in public that will change your life. Um, it is not necessarily having a specific goal in, uh, in mind to um, to have success because it recognizes the role of luck and complete random chance in uh, the in how your career develops. You don't necessarily know what you want and you don't necessarily know what's out there. So how can you think hard enough to get the thing that you really want when you don't know what you want and you don't know what's out there, right? Learning in public is designed for you to maximize your luck by taking concrete actions that can be seen by others that can be referred to by yourself, but not to um, keep it to yourself, essentially. That is the main concept that I want to instill in you today because it's really changed my life. So uh, what is learning in pub public? Uh, basically you can define it in opposition from learning in private. Um, so yeah, Darren in the chat says, how do you think hard enough on something you don't know much about yet? Exactly, uh, especially when you're a beginner in a field, there's so much you don't know. So really you need a mental model of how to figure out what to know that you don't know, figure those things out and then discover what else you don't know and what else does everybody not know uh, and figure out what it, what it is you really want. Anyway, most of our lives we're taught to learn in private. Uh, when, we, when we go to school, we take notes, we study them at home, we take tests and we hope to uh, do better than our peers. It's all very zero sum. Learning in public is something that is unique to us, particularly in tech, where we are encouraged to share our mistakes and our learnings in the hopes that everybody will get better. But I don't want it to seem like it is a generous or an act of charity. It's not a generous action. You're doing this because it is genuinely a faster way to learn than learning on your own in private, right? It is a self-interested thing because that is the only way you will keep at it. You don't, you don't donate to charity that often. You don't donate that much to charity, but you can work very, very hard at improving yourself. And if it happens to improve other people, uh, if it happens to get you a lot of friends, then that's all the better, right? So um, what I'm trying to present is basically what they call a Pareto optimal improvement. Um, whatever you're doing in private, it can be that much better if you can figure out a sustainable way to do it in public. So the origin of this idea for me um, comes from a few sources. Um, who is basically, um, I saw my internet connection is unstable. Did I disconnect for a bit? Can you still hear me, Darren? Uh, I know I freeze uh, up sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do here. Um, I've been having in, in random internet issues. Anyway, Scott Hanselman is basically the developer advocate for Microsoft, uh, for Azure, for Windows, for C Sharp. Um, he is a very, very senior guy in Microsoft um, and has impacted the lives of hundreds of thousands of developers. 
Um, and he came out with this blog post talking about the dark matter developers, the unseen 99%. It's kind of like the physics concept of dark matter. You can infer their presence by their effects of gravity on stuff around them. You can see their impact in downloads and um, usage numbers, but you can't really see them talking about stuff. And this is a very common law of the internet. Most people lurk, very, very few people comment or post. This is to your advantage because you stand out just by doing something, anything in public. The other source of inspiration comes from um, Brad Frost, who is the inventor of atomic design and a lot of other core programming and design concepts. Brad Frost gave a TEDx talk talking about creative exhaust, how when you do work, it's actually really interesting to spin out uh, ideas along the way as you do stuff to make it a habit because it, it's a very sustainable way to create content about your work, to get people interested in your work, to share what you learn and get feedback that might improve your day-to-day -day work. And so instead of creative exhaust, because he's a designer and I'm not a designer, I would talk about learning exhaust. Well, how can you make it sustainable such that you're doing your day-to-day tasks, you're learning about stuff, but you're still blogging about it, you're still writing it up without being a huge burden, right? You don't spend like a month away, locked away in a cabin, coming out with this elaborate medium blog post and uh, having it be very disruptive to your life, right? So the concept of learning public is basically this. You want to create learning exhaust. You want to write for past you, like write the post that you wish you had, uh, you know, three to six months ago to benefit future you because invariably you're gonna forget whatever you learned and you're gonna need a reference point. Or in 10 years, you wanna look back and say, oh, how cute. Um, you know, there's so much that I didn't know, or this is how I thought about things back then. You document what you learned and the problems you solve. And this is the most important thing. Try your best to be right, but don't worry when you're wrong. Because if you try to be perfect, try to have no mistakes whatsoever, you will never publish anything because there's no such thing as having no mistakes. There's no such thing as knowing everything. You have to keep a regular schedule of putting stuff out there. Um, and that's something that is a very tricky balance, right? Because obviously you want to be responsible. You want to say, I did my research, I did my work. Here's everything I know. And you know that when you put stuff out there that's wrong, people are going to attack you because that's what they do online, right? But still, if you're just honest about what you've done, if you're very low ego, if you tried your best to be right, you will learn something. People will see you learning something and they will organically want to help you and you will be better for them. Uh, you'll, be learn you'll be learning faster than you would by yourself. So what are the forms of learning in public? You can write, speak, ask, code, avoid, and miscellaneous. So <laughs> let's talk about this. You can write blogs and tutorials and cheat sheets. So that's the easiest form of write of uh, learning in public because it requires, doesn't require your face, doesn't require your voice, doesn't require any media skills apart from putting letters together. Speaking uh, takes a bit more presentation skills, but some people are very good at presentation and make things, making things interesting. Asking on Stack Overflow and Reddit, even the, the act of just putting stuff out there uh, can just be asking. Um, code, you can contribute issues, demos, libraries. Uh, you wanna avoid some of the walled gardens. I will say that my thoughts on Discord in particular have moved a little bit. Um, Discord can be a nice testing ground before you put something in the broader population, right? So there's a concept of like a group chat where you test stuff before you get feedback on it, before you blast it out to the a broadcast audience. Um, and then the miscellaneous stuff are YouTube, Twitch, uh, drawing cartoons, if you, if you can draw, by the way, that's a learning and public superpower. Anyone who can draw and illustrate concepts that are normally boring computer science, abstract stuff, and turn it into appealing concepts, um, I think is, are, are superheroes. So the two, there, there's some examples that I will show you later. One example of a talk which I really enjoyed was uh, this talk at Bang Bang Con in New York City called Tail Call Optimization. Uh, I'm very proud to call Anjana Vakilo a friend now, but this is them explaining TCO, which is a very compiler, which is compiler optimization. This is one of those things where like, it really doesn't matter until you're uh, deep into performance optimization, but it's explaining that in terms of a Disney musical and they wrote rhymes and songs and performed it and no one ever forget, forgets this explanation after they're done. So um, I highly recommend uh, using whatever skills you have to make learning fun because they definitely learned everything that they could about TCO before making this musical, which uh, I thought was really cool. 
So I try to do my own version of it. Um, I also do um, Moana parodies. I do Hamilton parodies. Uh, my thing is musical as well. So um, I try to talk about it. But, you know, I think this is more entertainment. I would not classify this as a lot of learning, but I think it makes things accessible and interesting and people can actually have real conversations. If you're highlighting a theme, highlighting a, a fact that somebody, some people didn't know. And that talk, this pitch on the left, the thing about Babel actually got me to speak at JSConf Hawaii, which is my second ever conference talk. Uh, and I'm still to this day very proud of it. And I think it's something where people give you opportunities if you can demonstrate that you love a topic, you um, are getting, uh, you, have, you have creative ideas around it, and you're not going to do the same thing that everyone else does. You stand out a little bit. So, okay, so I talked about the cartoons earlier. Uh, two people, look, her cartoons are not that cartoony. You know, she's talking about Linux networking tools, Unix protocols. Um, it's really not that high skilled, but it's presented in a friendly way that is very accessible. And look at the number of engagement that she has. And she's selling this as zines to support her independent work. Um, but I just think it's, it's not that hard. The bar is not that high for you to get out there and use your skills to explain programming concepts to the broader world uh, and to get a lot of attention and notice and also to learn stuff. I guarantee you in the process of compiling this, she learned a ton of things that she didn't know because she was looking for a definitive list of all the tools that she was talking about and trying to explain it in simple words. She used two to four words to explain every single concept, right? And that shows real mastery of something um, because it, it is, it is more accessible than some of the very tough documentation to read. Um, Lynn Clark is the other one. So Lynn Clark is, uh, I think she calls herself a code cartoonist. Uh, and she explained WebAssembly using one of her cartoons. She's also very famous for explaining React and Redux using cartoons as well. And again, you may not be able to draw, I cannot draw, I cannot aspire to this. I'm just showing you as this is one example of a general category of use your skills, use your unfair advantages to try to learn in public, to make things fun and interesting for yourself and for the people who think like you, right? You don't have to appeal to everyone in the whole world, just the people who think like you. Another uh, person I really like, so this person probably cannot draw, but she has some sense of visual design. So this is Samantha Ming, uh, and she's, she's demonstrating code concepts of simple code samples that are appealing, that are nicely presented. And she's built a giant Twitter following just doing that. And she actually got a job at GitLab because she did so much JavaScript work that they actually got her in for an interview, right? So um, I think this is a very fascinating, these, and by the way, these are the easy ones, right? I'm about to show you much more advanced stuff. If you think that this is very basic, yes, they're very basic, but don't over-focus on the level of programming that's being taught, taught. Focus on the methods, because the methods can be applied to whatever you are actually interested in. So the other format, the other problem that a lot of people come uh, to me with is, yeah, I put stuff out there, but nobody reads it, so why bother, right? Well, there's some truth to that. When you're starting out, it's true that nobody knows who you are. So I, I don't, if I don't know who you are, I'm not going to spend that much time on it. Um, so one, it's a good thing because this is the time that you will suck the most. So you want to get all the, your, your crap out there. You want to experiment with all your formats before you get big, before you get famous, before everybody knows your name, because the bar becomes much higher once you are more established. But if nobody knows you, whatever, experiment, get weird, get out there, know your tools, figure out your process, uh, try a few things and see what sticks. It's also probably false that nobody will read it. Because if you're talking about someone else's work, and if you're talking about my work, I'll probably read it because I don't have I don't get that feedback that often. Um, if it's if I'm your friend and if I'm your relative, you know, if you're your sibling or whatever, I'll probably read it. Send it to your mom; they'll read it. They don't understand it, but they'll read it. <laughs> um, and it, ultimately, it doesn't matter. It's for it's about you improving yourself, right? This is a learning public is a single player game that can go into a multiplayer game, but you still win, even if nobody else reads it, right? Because you spent the effort writing stuff down, explaining it to yourself, putting it in your own words, and putting it up on the internet, 
so that future you can reference it in the future, right? A lot of the things that I do now, I just punch it into Google and I'm the first link that, that shows up because I use the words that I search for when I write up my solution. And therefore I can use Google as my ser personal search engine. And that's amazing, but also there are a lot of people who think like me that find it anyway, right? So it's not true that nobody will read it. And anyway, just get it out there and start getting better, right? You're not gonna get better just by waiting for you to be famous and then to start writing stuff. So they will read it. People, uh, people that you're writing about, they care. There aren't that many people giving feedback. Um, so my personal story about this is the one time, the, the first time that my blogging, my writing got uh, read by a wide range of people was in 2018 when Danny Bramov uh, presented the future of React at GSConf Iceland. When he did that, I was like, this is huge. So what I did was I stayed up all night going through line by line his demo and writing a blog post uh, to explain that and walk through of it. So of course, when I'm the first person to write a response post about his talk, he's going to read it, he's going to find my mistakes, and he's going to correct me. And then he's going to help me share my work because that's the most extensive work that I've ever done, uh, that, that has been done on his post because I was the first to do it. <laughs> and so that, that started a relationship with him that got me in front of uh, his audience. And that's how you get started picking up what others put down. And that's a core principle um, that I stress a lot. It's, that's how you get started. Um, to uh, you know, get attention, pay attention to others, right? Be interested in what other people are interested in and they'll be interested in your work. Alina says, I just gave a talk on GraphQL. It'll be on LinkedIn. Uh, awesome, you know, and people who are working on GraphQL, they'll probably care about it, you know, and, and you should get feedback from them as well. All right, so I put some links down in there if you want to check it out, uh, my blog post um, that drove this story. Okay. Um, then the second part, the peanut gallery. This is a fantastic phenomenon. This is the XKCD, XKCD 386, one of the more famous XKCDs. Are you coming in bed? I can't. This is important. What? Someone is wrong on the internet, and I have to correct them. I have to tell them they're an idiot. They're wrong. They don't know anything. Here's the correct answer. That's fantastic if you don't get offended, right? Because when you're wrong online, people will do this to you, and they'll call you names, and they'll be rude about it. And that's okay because they're responding to something internally within themselves. They should not be that mean. Um, and it's not okay to be that mean online. But still, if you're willing to keep your ego small and take the feedback to improve yourself, because the only goal is to improve yourself, not to look good on the internet, not to look smart, not to defend yourself, just to improve your skills and your knowledge, then these people are helping you, right? So this is called Cunningham's Law, right? Which is um, that they will try to, they'll try to correct you um, as, 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 as quickly as possible online. Uh, that's, a, that's a fundamental law of the internet. So bottom line is try your best to rewrite. Don't worry when you're wrong. You want to always ship. You want to understand that be, being wrong is fine and you want to keep your ego small. Um, there's a uh, apocryphal story about the ceramics class where uh, you know, two groups of people, uh, uh, where there was a the class that was split into two groups. One group focused on quantity, they just kept producing uh, 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 pottery every single day. Whereas one group focused on quality, they just, they just worked and worked and worked on a single uh, example to try to get it perfect. The people who produced much more quantity um, actually got uh, much more quality as a result. So the real message of this parable is that quantity begets quality, not the other way around. You can't just sit around waiting for perfection um, and just hoping that it, it, it comes out right on, on your first attempt. So, uh, apologies for the F bomb here, but this is a mentor of mine. What I call this is the resilience, persistence, excellence loop, right? The cool thing about learning in public is getting comfortable with screwing up in public, which then accelerates the tolerance for future screw ups and then accelerates the learning process. This is a very, very positive uh, virtual. Uh, positive loop, which I highly encourage, right? So it's not just about the single first attempt getting off the ground, but it is the infinite loop of improving yourself and improving your response to feedback. So there are a number of reasons why it works. Um, I list them all in, in, in the PDF that I'm gonna to send to you later. Um, so 
here's a, here's a bunch of reasons. So people will notice when you do work about them, especially when you do good work, there's a lot of laws of human psychology. So for example, there's Cunningham's law, Cunningham's law that we talked about. There's a commitment factor of saying, all right, I, I'm going to do this. And then you actually do it. You, if you announce publicly something that you're committing to do something, then you follow through, like that is a commitment factor for you to follow through on what you promise. Positive reinforcement. When you get likes, when you get reshares, when you get feedback on something that you did, you're more likely to keep going, <laughs> right? Much more, it's much more motivating than if you're working by yourself and just trying to motivate yourself with no feedback. And then finally, availability bias. People often confuse the best at something with the person that first comes to mind, right? And a lot of marketers uh, confuse this uh, as well, but you can take advantage of it, right? In other words, if you want to be the best person uh, for GraphQL, right? If you if you if you said that you're you're you know you're publishing a talk about it, um, you just do a lot of GraphQL stuff. Naturally, your name will come up when people need a GraphQL person, right? And so that's an availability bias. There's also a concept called inbound marketing. I don't have the time to explain that to you today, but Google it. Uh, it's a fascinating story of how one company changed the entire marketing field by inventing a term inbound marketing, which is essentially getting permission for other people to, uh, to consume your content. And then finally, building portable capital. Uh, this is a very fundamental story for me because it's intellectual property that will stay with you no matter what job you're at. So imagine if, if, if as the years go by, you just accumulate this body of work that you can show that clearly belongs to you. Um, that you can take with you from job to job. I think that is uh, a really fascinating uh, fundamental explanation of why learning in public works so well. So um, I think I'll have, I'll have some stuff here. So um, what I, yeah, sorry. All right. Everything I just explained was the getting off the ground, the, the very basics, you know. Um, then there's advanced versions, which you should not feel like you need to do. But I think when I started doing these things, I really got to step up in terms of my profile, my learning, my network, whatever you call it. So there's teaching, there's live coding, there's double dipping, which is essentially putting your content out in one medium and then recycling it for a different medium. You know, I blog and then I speak about it. I speak about it and I podcast. I podcast and I, uh, I don't know, do a TikTok or something. I don't actually do any TikToks. Um, <laughs> pick up what they put down, we talked about earlier, and then mentoring others, mentoring uh, juniors. And then basically understanding much more about a topic because you're trying to teach it rather than uh, learning it for the first time. So we talked about benefits. Um, I think one thing that I'm gonna focus on, so you're connecting with, with mentors, you're connecting with friends, you're building a track record. I think one thing that, that I don't talk about enough is interviewing. So one of my favorite stories is when I interviewed at Amazon. So I was uh, at Amazon in 2020. And um, one of my, my favorite interviews ever was me going to the Amazon headquarters, I'm going through the super day, which is like the, the last round. They put you through, through a, a whole bunch of software engineer interviews. And the guy comes in, he's holding his laptop and then he sits down and, and I say, hi, he's never met me before. And, he, and I say hi to him and start introducing myself. And he was like, don't bother. I just, I've been, I've been reading your blog for the past 15 minutes. I know uh, this, is, this interview is just a formality. Um, so basically I skipped the process just by proving um, through my work that I was up for, I was capable of the job or like I was interested enough and authentically able to explain things or to, to, uh, to deliver more value in my blog or my public work than through a 45 minute interview. And that's what interviewing really is. You know, the, the process of hiring and process of interviewing is really risk reduction. Like I have to, because you don't put enough out there in public, all I have is your resume. All I have is your LinkedIn then I have to interview you to figure out what else there is about you that I should know about. But if your work is in public, then I can just see that work, right? Um, I don't have to bet on like your, the, the, very leak, the very lossy serialization and deserialization algorithm. I need to serialize all my years of experience into a one page resume and then hope that the other side has the right deserialization code to, to unpack all that uh, capability from, from that one page of resume, right? Like uh, it's much better to be presenting your work in native platforms that people pay attention to like conference speaking, blogging, Hacker News, Reddit, whatever. So that is the interviewing process. And then finally, of course, giving back. It is very uh, rewarding. Um, 
and just yet just yesterday I had a uh, person join Twitter for the first time talking about how she read my book and she was very she was very excited to learn in public and hundreds of people welcomed her I thought it was just fascinating I'll just show you I, I just I don't I, I I would say like this is the one of the more unique examples I've ever seen um, this person was not active on Twitter uh, before this this <laughs> <laughs> so not active she registered it in 2020 then she was like okay everyone i'm going to publicly uh you know i, I just she just finished reading a book very convinced to learn in public and being active on twitter hundreds of people are just welcoming her and saying yeah join us you know this is a very, very welcoming community and now she has uh you know all these other examples where she can start really building it off this happened yesterday so she's still getting started but i was just so inspired by her because i was like yeah like that's that's how welcoming the tech community can be if you phrase it right. Okay. Um, so story time number two, um, I will say um, getting into TypeScript from React. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is one example of, of, this is probably the most um, effective example of me learning in public that I've ever done. Uh, I don't know if I can top this because it really went amazing. So uh, my first job, I needed to, Right, uh, reactive TypeScript, and I didn't know it. My my, my boss was like, "You know, you know TypeScript, right?" And I was like, "No, I don't." Um, so I had I had to start to learn it on a very accelerated schedule, and I found that the docs were missing. The React docs, because they were promoting Flow at the time, they did not have good TypeScript documentation. The TypeScript docs did not have good React support. So I just created my subset of subset of a subset of React and TypeScript intersection, right? And I and I created that, and I just documented it. I pasted in everything I wish I knew. Um, and then anything I didn't know, I just I just um, researched it and I added it in. And now that repo has thirty five thousand stars, um, it, which is insane. Uh, I have taught people from Airbnb, Microsoft, Uber, whatever. I've taught those kinds of people TypeScript, and they have taught me every single time they filed an issue or a PR. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you're famous. Obviously, you uh, people would do that with you. This was before anyone knew who I was. Um, and I think if you basically just create a thing that people wish existed and you are just consistent about it, people will join you in that mission. Find a good mission and people will join you. So, um, yeah. Let's see. People are asking for links. So I'll just drop that in the chat right here. You can find it easily. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is literally the, that was my announcement tweet, um, and then and then I just kept adding to it uh, over the span of four years. Okay, um, what else do I have for you? Story time number three. This is my most successful talk ever, um, and basically it's an attempt to explain things from first principles. What is the form of first principles for software? Which is if you can take something complex that everybody knows, and write your own mini clone of it from scratch, from a blank file. You can write every single piece and explain how everything works in a sufficient enough complexity, right? So basically I wrote React in 26 lines of code and people are like, what? You can do that? Um, and then I got some feedback and then it became a workshop, then it became a blog post, then it became a talk. Uh, and, and to this day, it's, it's one of the best talks I've ever done. Um, and so that is a form, iterative form of learning in public. Um, I think I blogged about it and I called it, um, so this is my blog. I called it bottom up idea exploration. So bottom, yeah, here. So if anyone is interested in the journey, this from beginning to end took about a year from, uh, oh, 18 months from 2019 to 2020. Uh, it started as a tweet and then went to a live stream, a blog post, lightning talk, live code, conference talk, and then job interview. I even presented it as part of a job interview as well. I even forgot about that. Um, but really, like that form of learning public is so easy to recycle. Um, and I highly encourage people to try doing some version of that. I've seen people do this, by the way, for writing a CSS and JS, uh, writing React router, writing um, Webpack, writing, you know, whatever, whatever you're trying to explain. If you can write it in a very simple way and explain that, um, you have fundamentally understood the tool uh, much better than reading through the entire documentation. So um, I don't say that everybody should learn in public. So people often view me as this like booster, 
promoter, whatever you call it. Um, I think that there is, learning probably is not for everyone. There's a question of personal safety. Some people are more vulnerable, especially if you're a minority, um, and some people might attack you more. Um, sometimes you might feel like you are a content grind, like you have to produce something every single week and it's, you, you feel stressed. Um, you might feel like you're spamming people. Um, other, other people complain like, oh my God, all these learning public people, you're overnight experts. You just read the docs yesterday. You have zero years of experience. Shut up and, you know, <laughs> uh, and don't say anything until you're, until you're 10 years of experience, right? Um, so to them, I think what you should say is, yes, like you are learning as you, you should make it obvious. You should not misrepresent yourself. You should not misrepresent yourself as an expert, but you should still try anyway, because it's not their right to stop you from learning in public, right? Um, and for people who are worried about their personal safeties, there, there are ways to dissociate your online persona with your, with your in-person uh, identity. Um, and you can produce more polished work instead of more raw work. Because raw work is more likely uh, a, you know, a target of criticism, whereas the more polished work is, is complete. Uh, there's nothing to criticize because it is complete. Like uh, a lot of times with Samantha Ming, there's nothing else to add. Like it's, it's just li literally, let me, show, let me show you the Samantha Ming stuff. What would you add to this? Uh, there are three ways to clone objects. There's not a fourth way, right? Unless she literally made a mistake in one of these things, then you can attack her. But like she didn't even put her face there. She's, it's a cartoon avatar. You're, you're just, you're just really, you just look really, really dumb or misogynistic if you attack a cartoon avatar who's just trying to teach people JavaScript concepts, right? So that is the kind of thing that you can try to do. There's a spectrum of learning in public and you choose how much public you want to be based on how comfortable you are in public, how vulnerable you are uh, in terms of personal safety. Okay, sorry, I'm just fasting through all this. Um, ba, 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 ba. I feel like I've gone more, more than 25 minutes already. Um, sorry, let me just skip through all this. Uh, okay, all right. All right, I'll, I'll end off with a concept of learning gears. There are different modes of learning and learning in public should vary based on where you are, what you are learning and, and, and uh, how quickly you're learning. So essentially this, this answers the question of how do I start learning in public? Um, and there are essentially three plus one gears. I've actually added a, a fourth gear. So let's talk about the, the four gears. The first gear is the explorer gear. The problem that you're solving is you don't know what you don't know. So you should only write notes to yourself. Um, you're not promising any output to anyone else. It's just whenever you have time, just put out whatever, it doesn't matter. No one's expecting anything from you. The commitment's very low, whatever, right? And your goal is to just cover as much ground as possible to figure out what you don't know. Because right now you don't even know what you don't know, right? So you should explore as much as possible, right? And for me, this is me in 2018. I was just blogging random shit uh, <laughs> and just putting it out there. I knew that nobody was reading it and it's fine, totally fine. Just making notes to myself. That is exploring, right? And you should feel comfortable doing that because you're exercising a muscle. This muscle will, come, will become very big later on. But when you're just starting out, don't hold yourself to the same standards of the big people out there that, you, that you're looking up to. Just start exercising in small ways, right? You're just exploring. Okay, then we're going into settler gear. Once you know what you don't know, it's time to run up that learning curve, right? Your exhaust now can be teaching stuff you just learned, putting stuff you, uh, you learned into your own words. You can write cheat sheets. You can write progress reports. We talked about the cheat sheets earlier. You have commitment of weeks to months. You should try to learn things on a structured curriculum, read books cover to cover, complete certification exercises, complete courses, Udemy, whatever, you, whatever you, you think about that is. Um, I think the settler gear is basically what we've been trained to do in school, right? In school, in college, university, there's a curriculum. You start at the top, you go down to the bottom, you learn everything there is to know about it, then you're good, right? Um, so I, I don't have a good example for that here, uh, but we'll, we'll, like, that, is, that is the uh, learning gear. Then from settler, we go to connector. Now, the problem is you now know things because you finished the selling gear. Now you settle, now you're gonna connect things from where you are to where you used to be. So you now know things others don't. So your exhaust is now meant for other people. You're, you're producing more polished work to explain things to others, like teaching them formally. You have some pet topics. You don't have a grand theme that you're developing over the course of your career. It's moderate, you're putting yourself out there, right? Um, 
uh, I find I think that Sarah Dressler is, is a is a canonical example of, of my work. She's also a, a former boss and mentor of mine, uh, and I uh, I would say definitely check out check out her work uh, if you're if you're interested because she's a very good connector. It teaches a lot of things. For example, design for developers is one of her top 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 topics as well. Um, Adam Weathen as well. Um, he's more of a full stack and uh, now CSS uh, Tailwind guy, but he's also you know trying to connect things things for people. He talks about a lot of uh, he steals a lot of ideas from the React community to implement in the Vue community. Steals ideas from the Vue community to implement in Laravel. Steals ideas from Laravel to implement in CSS and so on and so forth. I think this is a very very fruitful way and. If anything, you should try to default to the connector gear because the connector gear is the most productive gear of your life, right? It's literally just take ideas from one place, explain it to other people, connect stuff together, connect domains together that are previously unrelated. Uh, there's a lot of fruitful development and ideas from there. Finally, there's the minor gear. When you find, you know everything that everyone else knows, but there's something that's still too unknown out there that nobody knows, humanity does not know, Something important is still too hard. So now your exhaust is not blogs about, you know, uh, how to install React. It's R&D, it's infrastructure, it's research, it's built to last. You're pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. Your output has one unifying theme. You have a grand purpose, a goal, and everyone knows you as that person that's, that's just working towards that goal. So your commitment is high. You're, you're spending years on this thing. It might define your entire career. And when you have struck gold, you'll know you're struck gold because you're both fascinated by it and other people are telling you that it's valuable. When you have struck gold, you should go into minor gear, right? Some people like, who are like, like this are Evan Yoon from, from Vue.js. He struck gold with Vue and, and, and people are just paying him uh, to work on, on it in open source. Um, other people, um, they have interesting concepts that I don't have time to highlight, but take a screenshot of this because uh, each of these are interesting blog posts that I want to send you to. Chris Coyer has Working in Public, Corey House has a fascinating talk called How to Become an Outlier. Ken C. Dodds calls it intentional career building. Jeff Atwood, the founder of Stack Overflow, calls it stop sucking and be awesome. All of these guys are basically trying to tell you different versions of the same thing, which is to learn in public. So I talk, here's, that's my talk about learning public and learning gears. Um, I also have a book version of this. Um, Sorry, let me, let me just fast forward to the end. I also have a book version of this. You can read the free chapter on learning public at learningpublic.org. Um, and that's it, that's my talk. All right, well, thank you so much, John, um, for, for this great talk. And I, I especially love the stories that you share. I think some of them just, yeah, I put the emoji in there, I was trying to find the, the mind blowing emoji. Because <laughs> the one <laughs> about the TypeScript one which really was just, it was just amazing um, and, and so I, encouraging. Yeah. I uh, was listening to an old podcast uh, of mine from 2019, and I was like, wow, this repo has reached 6,000 stars. I was like, this this mind this mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is amazing. Like, yeah, I'm sure you didn't expect things to to go so big, you know, when you first started. Um, but it's amazing how, yeah, how things can can progress like that. Um, I know we're a little bit over the, the, a lot of time, so if some of you need to go, feel free. But I still wanted to 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 leave a little bit of time in case people have questions for for Sean. Um, yeah. So if you have anything, just pop in the chat right now. Yeah, we'll. we'll Wait a couple minutes and see. Or if you have a video, I could do two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got one for Francis. So, what's the best way to learn React? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, best way to learn React is to probably go through the beta docs, beta.react.react.js.org. Uh, um, you build as few sample projects. Um, I think the best the best ex exercise that I've come across is called seven GUIs. Um, and basically don't stop until you know um, how to do all this. Um, so seven tasks, to build a to-do list, oh, sorry. Uh, build a counter, uh, you know, un understand how to build a basic counter, then how to do bi-directional data flow, then understand how to build a basic uh, flight booker with some more complex mathematical logic. Then you build a timer with some uh, side effects uh, that are time dependent. Uh, and you go all the way until you're building a spreadsheet. And once you can do that, I, I'm pretty sure you can say that, you know, React. Mm -hmm. So this is seven GUIs. Seven GUIs. Okay. 
Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I'm actually trying to learn React myself. So I might, I might also steal that. It's <laughs> good. Um, Another way, right. you know, when I, when I was uh, still running the uh, React subreddit, um, um, so we have a beginner's questions and answers thing here. Uh, and this is something I started um, to really try to help uh, beginners. Let me see. Uh, this is monthly be beginner Q&A thread. So essentially, oh man, it's the, I think the search is broken. So essentially, you know, there's hundreds of questions and answers here. Go in and answer other people's questions. Because a lot of times the way that you're learning is limited by the amount of questions that you can come up with. But if you can answer all the other people's questions that you never thought about, then you're learning at their rate. So this is all about the algorithm for learning, right? Why not increase the algorithm, the number of N uh, that you're learning at from N of one to N of like a hundred? That's my answer. Wow, yeah, that's insightful. I never saw it like that. You're learning other people's brain. That's that's what you, what you do by answering other questions. Thank you for that. Uh, I think Matthew Liu, uh, what is your process for writing a blog post? Yeah, um, it really depends what kind of blog post. Um, so there's some blog posts that are throwaway. So some, for example, um, sometimes I had a I had a meetup and then I I had a really interesting conversation in a meetup, then I'll just write it on the spot. And that, that would just, I took maybe half an hour to write this. Um, and sometimes I will have it in drafts. So I actually have a draft uh, second brain called Obsi uh, Obsidian. Um, then I'll have all these uh, examples of uh, blogs, blog posts I want to do. So I incubate my blog post ideas here. And sometimes I'll just like put in some notes, put in some data points, put in some uh, relevant tweets. And once it's ready, once I feel like writing it, then I'll fully bake it into a blog post. So um, here's, uh, here's one that I'm trying to uh, develop right now into, into a separate thing. So I just break it out into a blog post. Uh, so the way, the, what I called in this is called Mies and Plus writing. Uh, essentially, instead of writing one post at a time, write 50 posts at a time, right? So um, you separate your pre-writing process from your actual writing. Uh, the idea for a blog post, the research for a blog post, your peer review, testing on an audience, reframing, organizing, illustration. You should do all of this simultaneously. And then when you're writing, you just write. Wow. Okay. This, this is cool. I feel like this is like a, like a life hack to, to blog post writing. Because, <laughs> yeah, really because ideas, out. research, uh, audience review, all this arrives randomly, right? So this is called, this is passive and serendipitous, but actually writing requires active and focused time, right? Mm -hmm. So you can only do this one at a time, but your pre-writing, you can just do it simultaneously. A lot of it is when I'm walking, when I'm listening to podcasts, when I'm talking to people at a conference, when I'm in the shower, whatever it is, have a system for capturing all that and just work on multiple posts at once. Whatever time is, time is right or whenever you're ready, then you just take it out to a writing process. Oh, awesome. Um... All right. Any any other questions? Um, yeah, I don't want to take too much of, of Sean's time. Okay. Someone asked, do you use any any tools? Uh, Obsidian. <laughs> <laughs> it's just any Markdown editor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple. I think it's nothing, <laughs> nothing crazy. Yeah, it's great. Um, These are, this is how I draft my talks as well. So original talk, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, uh, and then I turn this into a talk. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I think it'll be easy for anyone to get started. Just obsidian. Um, all yeah, right. So, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm glad you learned. Um, yeah. Any last minute questions before we, we close up? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for for joining. And and Sean, what what would be the best way to if people want to just follow you or even ask you follow up questions after events? Yeah, you can find me on at Swix online, uh, or you can find oh, my actually, yeah. blog here at Swix Swix .io. Okay. Let me. Yeah, I, I have your Twitter here. Let me let me post it in the chat. 
Okay. All right. So yeah, you can follow John on Twitter here. Um, yeah, there's some some information about future events. Um, so feel free to check that out. Um, yeah, before we officially close, uh, Sean, like, do you have any last minute or, or like not last minute, but like final remarks or encouragement that you want to leave with your audience before you go? Um, here. I'll leave you with one abstract thing because I, I feel like I touched on it, but I never really explained um, uh, explained what I mean. So what we are really trying to do when we learn in public is to create luck, is to expand our luck surface area for lucky things to happen to us by doing, pe by doing more things and telling people about it. By this manner, we are more lucky than other people who are not doing that. 